What do you think about that parallel? Is that a sound parallel? Have I overlooked important differences that also are relevant to the moral judgment so that while you might want to stick to the moral judgment that it would be wrong of somebody not to rescue the child in a pond, we're not led to make a similar moral judgment about people who don't help to do anything about global poverty and therefore to help save the lives of people who are dying because of global poverty? Yes. Okay, so the first suggestion is that there's a difference in how to help or in our knowledge of how to help. That's, that's very straightforward in the case of the child in the pond. You just run in, pull the child out, find the parents presumably, um, uh, and give the child back. Maybe you give them a little lecture about looking after their child better, but anyway, you, you know what to do. Um, whereas in the other case, it seems more difficult. How do we help? How do we know that we're helping? So let me just take that point rather than comment on it at the moment, see whether there are other points people want to raise. One here. Okay, good. So you've taken us back to the debate about abortion where I've said the fact that the fetus has the potential to be a rational being is not enough given the fact that the world has lots of rational beings in it, maybe as many as it can comfortably support, um, is not enough reason to say uh, that it's wrong to abort the fetus. Um, what's, what's the difference here? Well, since that is, uh, uh, relates to something we talked about before, I'll, I'll respond to that right now. Um, one difference clearly is that uh, you could think about the parents of the child. So in the case of a woman who wants to have an abortion, she's made that decision that she doesn't want to have this child and clearly while she may well have some regrets that her circumstances are such that she can't have a child, um, but on balance that's her judgment, uh, that's her decision, it's what she wants and she's not going to therefore be grief stricken over the abortion. You know, sometimes later she may have remorse but in general I think women who terminate their pregnancies continue to think that they made the right decision, tough as it sometimes is. So in the case of a child who dies, a uh, child uh, under five who dies, um, parents are going to be grief stricken about the loss of their child. Um, even though the deaths of children in developing countries may be more common than they are here, much more common than they are here, it's still not the normal run of events and parents who have a child still love and cherish that child and are going to care for that child. So one thing is you could just think of it, if you like, in terms of the, the parents and their attitudes. But you can also think of it in terms of the child suffering because the child is, you know, if, for example, if the child has malaria, um, it's an unpleasant disease. Uh, you don't die from it immediately or quickly. Uh, you go through lots of episodes of fever and distress. So you could think about that. And depending on whether this is a newborn child or an older, somewhat older child, we're talking about children under five, you know, you may well feel that the, that the child itself now has started to have interests in going on living in a way that a fetus, which is not even a conscious being, doesn't have. So um, that may not be true for early newborn deaths, as we talked about with Professor Dvoratz, but I certainly think it is true once you get a little bit past birth. So I think that there's those differences, but it's a reasonable question. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, all right, down the front here. I think there is a difference. Okay, so a second, a second difference is that in the case of the child in the pond, I said that you were the only person there. So the responsibility falls entirely on you. Whereas what I've been talking about, you suggested the responsibility falls on the public. Um, you could say that. You could say also it falls on every one of us individually. That would be another way of looking at it. But certainly it's true that there are many, many people who could be doing something, not just me. So in that sense, the responsibility seems to be diffused. Okay, let's take that one on board. And there's a hand right behind you as well, yeah? Okay, so, so this 
point of difference was that, uh, as I described the child in the pond, you only do this once. You know, in fact, probably none of you will ever be in a situation to rescue a small child from a shallow pond. But if you were, uh, it would be quite extraordinary if that were to happen more than once. Whereas if you do something to donate to an organization to provide bed nets for children who are in danger of getting malaria, having made that donation today, um, you could also make it tomorrow and the next day and for a very long time to come at least. Hopefully one day we'll solve this problem, but until we do solve this problem, you're going to be able to do that. And then there will be other problems, not just malaria, but so on. So you could say, yes, um, there's a question about how demanding this morality can be, given that the problem is such a large problem that we can't solve individually. So that's also true. Anybody else? Anybody am I missing up in the gallery wants to comment? Yes, okay, we'll take you and maybe we'll finish with that. Okay, that's interesting. So you've pointed to an emotional difference that we, we see this child in front of us, there's some connection uh, that we have, uh, and we don't have that with 6.6 .6 million children whom we don't see and which is in a way just a statistic. Um, and that's an interesting point. And let, let, me, let me go on with that one for, for a few moments. Um, I think you're, you're undoubtedly right as a matter of psychological fact. Uh, we relate to individuals in a way that we don't relate to the mass. Um, and there's some interesting research on this which shows the importance of connecting in some way with an individual, even if it's not an actual individual in front of you. Um, the research was done uh, by a psychologist called Paul Slovic and his colleagues, and they did it like this. Uh, they got students at a university to volunteer to come in for a psychology experiment for which they were going to be paid $15. They were not told anything about the nature of the experiment. So they came into a room, um, they were given a questionnaire and told to fill in the questionnaire. That took them 15 or 20 minutes. They came back uh, to somebody at desk, handed in the questionnaire. Um, he gave them $15 in small notes. And in fact, only at that point did the experiment really begin. As well as giving them the money, he gave them some information. And on a random basis, they were divided into two groups. One group was told, each month our psych lab adopts a particular charity. Um, the charity we're supporting this month is helping children in Malawi. There are thousands of children in Malawi who go to bed every night, um, this was on a piece of paper, uh, who go to bed hungry every night, um, would you like to help some of them? And then there was, uh, a box into which they could put, if they wished, some of the $15 that they were given. The other students were given a similar piece of paper, but it had a picture of a small African child. And it said on it, this is Rokia, she's seven years old, she lives in Malawi. She goes to bed hungry because her family is poor and can't afford enough, they can't afford to give her enough to eat. Would you like to help her? and there was the same box. Well, as you might guess from what I've said, significantly more students gave when they were given the identifying information about Rokia than those who were given the more broad information about thousands of children being hungry. If you think of it, this is sort of strange. If you think of this from a purely sort of rational point of view, this is strange because these were university students. They presumably weren't stupid. Um, they must have known, if they'd stopped to think for a minute, that it wasn't that the lab was collecting all this money to give to Rokia. I mean, you know, then Rokia, one child in Malawi, was going to really become relatively wealthy for a child in Malawi, whilst all the rest of the children were going to be just as hungry as before. They must have realized that Rokia is a kind of a token child, a token of the type of child that we're helping. But in fact, they gave more. So presumably, it was, as you were suggesting, that they felt an emotional 
pull to this child, and although they didn't think they were only giving to her, that emotional pull prompted them to give. And I think that is a real problem in terms of getting people to address global poverty as an issue. It's a problem because um, it is a statistic. It's very hard to make it individual in this way. You can do things, as, as that said, you can, you can appeal to people, uh, individuals. Uh, some charities try to get people to adopt a child in the sense of sending money to a particular child. But that's not really the most effective way of helping because a lot of problems need more systematic approach. If you put in safe drinking water for a village, not for an individual family, for instance. So, um, so there is this problem that we're not emotionally moved by global poverty in the way that we would be moved by a child in front of us. But the question I want you to think about is, that may explain why we don't give that much to the global poor, but does it justify the difference? Does it justify us in thinking it's less wrong not to give? I mean, once you realize this, don't you also realize that this shouldn't really make a difference to whether it's right or wrong to help somebody? The fact that you're emotionally drawn to them? Um, I mean, our emotions may be triggered by all sorts of things. Again, there's research showing that we're more likely to respond emotionally to somebody who looks rather like us. Um, but we know that that's not a good basis for deciding how to help. That's uncomfortably close to racism. And we may consciously try and get around that. So shouldn't we also consciously try to get around the fact here that um, our children, that, that uh, we are not emotionally pulled in the same way? Okay, let's look at some of these um, other things that uh, were said. So, for example, it was said that um, it's not just my responsibility in this situation. Um, it's uh, everybody could take part. And I think that's also another reason why we give less. Again, there's research showing that when we're not the only one responsible, we're less likely to help. Uh, let me give you another example of that, that kind of research, which in a way is, I think, quite disturbing. So it's another example of, you, you need to be careful about psychology experiments. It's another example where students were actually uh, deceived about the purpose of the experiment. They, they were asked to come in to do an experiment, weren't told what it was about, given questionnaires to fill in. Um, and sometimes they filled in these questionnaires in a room where there was another person also filling in a questionnaire, and sometimes they walked into the room and there was nobody else in the room. The person who gave them the questionnaire then went into another room where they couldn't see her, but they could hear her moving things around the room, dragging furniture or something perhaps, and then um, they heard a thud as if she'd fallen off something, and she started crying out and saying, um, oh, help, I've hurt my leg. Um, now, if the person who was the real person doing the experiment was alone in the room, they almost always jumped up and ran into the next room to help, as you would hope they would. But if there was somebody else in the room, that person was actually a stooge, not just another student filling the experiment. And when the cry for help came, that person sort of looked up, it was obvious that he'd heard the cry for help, and then went back to filling in the questionnaire. And that made it significantly more likely that the other person would not help either. In other words, the other person who was genuinely the subject of the experiment took his or her cues from, from other people around. And I think that that's what we do in this situation too. We're influenced by the fact that we know a lot of other people are not giving. We may also be influenced by a feeling of that it would be unfair if we gave and other people, some of whom are wealthier than us, were not to give. So I think that also influences us um, against giving. And then there's the factor that we feel that this is potentially a limitless obligation, a very demanding obligation. 
That one I'm not going to really address now because we're going to talk about that. Um, I think it's the first class after the mid-semester break, if I remember correctly. We're going to talk about, about how demanding morality might be. 